Hi, my name is Sarah, and welcome to Grace River Church Online. We are so excited that you're joining us today. And my name is Gabe, and I am a small group leader here at Grace River. If you would like more information about our church or would like to post a prayer request, please visit the website below. And if this is your first time joining with us, we're going to ask that you text the word first to the number listed below on the screen. And the great part about that is that you receive a $5 gift card on us to Starbucks. Again, thank you for joining with us. We hope you enjoy the worship.
Hey, what's up? Welcome to Church Online at Home. My name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace River Church, and I'm thrilled that you're watching online today. I hope wherever you're at on the journey that this uh, encourages you to take a next step on your journey. And so we uh, are starting a brand new series today called God Loves the Real You. And I want you to know uh, our biggest problem is not that we don't love God enough. Our biggest problem is we don't understand how much God loves us. And when I say that, it's like, man, God loves the unfiltered, real version of you. And so today, as we walk through this talk, uh, we're going to be in John chapter 4, so you can follow along with your Bibles. Uh, I'll have the words on the screen as well. Uh, something we really encourage everybody at Grace River to do is to download the YouVersion Bible app and to follow along uh, on your phone, and you can highlight things and share verses, and man, it's just a really, really great way to read God's word and to begin to digest it yourself. And so John chapter four is where we're going to be at today. And so uh, you can take your Bible out. We're going to start in verse three. And uh, here's what the story is. Jesus is traveling with his disciples uh, and they travel into a, a country called Samaria and they travel there on purpose. In fact, most Jewish travelers during this time period would have avoided uh, this route. They would have actually gone on a two or three day journey around Samaria but Jesus instead decides to go direct, a direct route directly through Samaria because he has a woman at a well that he has to meet. And this woman is a Samaritan woman. This is significant because Jews and Samaritans historically had no dealings with each other. In fact, this has been a, this has been a rivalry uh, uh, up, up to about 450 years during this time period of bad blood between these two different groups of people. So this would have been uh, racial, uh, this would have been prejudice, uh, this would have been a scandalous thing for Jesus to talk, number one, to a woman, uh, and then number two, uh, to talk to a Samaritan woman. And we're going to actually find out a little bit about this woman's reputation here later and, and realize that this was even more scandalous because Jesus was talking to her uh, and she'd been married five different times and the woman and the man that she was with today uh, she wasn't married to. And so uh, John chapter four, verse three says this. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. So he didn't have to, but he chose to go through Samaria. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. And so uh, he, he goes to this place and ends up at a well. Jacob's well was there and Jesus was tired from a long walk. Now this is really significant because in John's gospel, John was one of the 12 disciples and he wrote about Jesus. And we get to see the humanity of Jesus here just for a moment. So Jesus wasn't a God robot. Jesus was 100% man and also 100% God. And we get to see a picture of his humanity. Why? Because he was tired from a long walk. We found out that Jesus himself got tired, grew weary, needed a drink, needed some rest. And that's what's happening here. He sat wearily beside the well at about noontime. So it's very significant the time of day that this was. Uh, I love when the Bible gives us clear imagery of what's going on. So can you go to this setting with me? He's in the Middle East. It's hot. There's not a lot of shade trees around. There's a well. It's noon. He's exhausted. And that's where we pick up the story. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her. Now this is where the scandal begins because now it's just Jesus and this Samaritan woman. He said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And so he opens up a conversation with this woman and says, please give me a drink. He was polite. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and you were, and were speaking to you, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. She's got all these excuses for Jesus. Like you can't, she, Jesus is talking about metaphorical uh, spiritual well that he's going to put in all of our hearts. She can't get her mind off of the physical well. She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks from this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink from the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh and bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And then she says this, because she's thirsty for something like this. She says, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water that I will never thirst again, and I won't have to come here to get water. And so there are four life-changing truths about God's love based off of this passage. So four 
uh, life-changing truths based off of this passage. Truth number one is God loves the real you even when other people don't. God loves the real you even when other people don't. Man, wouldn't it be nice if everybody liked us, if everybody loved us? I think part of the problem with our culture today is we are looking uh, for approval in all of the wrong places. But what I love about God is, is God loves me even whenever other people don't love me. God loves me even whenever I don't love myself. You know, the greatest commandment uh, is, to, is to love God and to love others as yourself. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 22. The greatest thing you could do with your life is to love God and to love others as yourself. What's really important about loving others as yourself is the fact that you have to love yourself. Now, I'm not saying like a selfish kind of love or a prideful kind of love, but I gotta believe this, man. A lot of people listening today would say, man, I don't even know if I love myself uh, because of some of the things that you've done in your past, uh, some things that you feel like are unforgivable. You have a hard time really looking at yourself in the mirror and going, man, can I even love me? And I want you to know today Jesus sits down next to this woman at this well at this point in time in her life and he almost gives her like a full length mirror and says, listen to me, daughter. Listen to me, son. I am crazy about you. And that's the thing. God loves the real you even when others don't. Significant that Jesus was at the well at noon and so was she. Because during this time period, women would gather water at the well for their household in the morning. Uh, whenever it was much cooler outside because she was ostracized from her community because uh, people didn't like her. She, she wasn't accepted. She didn't have a lot of friends. Because of that, she would go to the well at noon. It was less awkward for her. That was her time to go. Uh, and you got to believe that the, as she's at the well, she's wishing that she could be there in the morning. Because in the morning, that was like a social hour at the well. That's whenever women would gather and do that. I mean, it's almost like a women's workout group or something like that that you could imagine, right? Uh, or it's a book club or whatever it is uh, that you like to do, right? So it's like a group of people that are gathering like that. And she's by herself isolated. And here's the thing. Jesus loved her because he knew that at noon she would be there. And I want you to know that no matter what you've done, God loves the real you. Even when others don't love you, God loves the real you. Truth number two is Jesus is the only one that can satisfy my deepest need. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy my deepest need. Man, we, we live in a very thirsty culture. We're always wanting more, right? I mean, if we're honest, we would love to have a bigger house with taller ceilings, uh, with more bedrooms. If we're honest, we'd love to have a newer car with less miles on it uh, and more space. We'd love to uh, have better relationships and better friendships. We'd love to have a job that pays us more money and makes us feel more satisfied. But I want to tell you something, honestly, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy your deepest needs. In verse 10, he's talking about this living water. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So, and again, Jesus replies, anyone who drinks from this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink from the water that I give will never get thirsty again. Jesus is out to satisfy your deepest need. And our problem is, is we look uh, for our deepest needs in all of the wrong places. And I want you to know, nothing is going to satisfy you. Nothing's going to satisfy your soul like Jesus. And so, uh, Again, truth number two, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy my deepest need. An honest question, if you only had what, then you'd be satisfied. What is your fill in the blank here? What is the thing that you could say, man, if I only had more of this, or if I only had this relationship, if I only had this, then I would have peace and satisfaction in my life. And I want you to know, if anything other than Jesus fills in this blank, your soul is always going to be thirsty. So truth number two, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy. Truth number three is don't try to hide your sins from God. Man, one of the biggest mistakes you can make, and this woman at the well, she tries to, to she attempts to do this. She doesn't realize that she's talking to the son of God and she tries to hide her sins. And, and we, mankind has been doing this from the very beginning. In, John, in, in Genesis chapter three, after Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They decided that they were gonna sow fig leaves together and they were going to hide from God. So we've been doing this from the very beginning. We think that we can hide from God. And here's the thing. Why would we play this game with the God who knows the deepest parts of our hearts? You see, you can fool your spouse. You can fool your friends. 
You can fool your coworkers. You can fool your extended family. But here's the thing. You can't hide and fool God from who you really are. God in Genesis chapter 3 actually asks Adam and Eve, he says, where are you? And that wasn't a geographical question. That was a heart question is, where are you with me? And so in this story, in John chapter 4, verse 16, he says, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. And she says, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And she was telling a partial truth. But what she wasn't saying was, is I've had five husbands and the man that I'm living with today I'm not married to. So we do three things when it comes to our sin. Is it really like instead of dealing with our sin in a healthy way, these are some unhealthy ways that we deal with our sin. First of all, we ignore it. So like we know that what we're doing is wrong, but we choose instead to keep doing these destructive patterns. And what instead of doing the right thing, we choose, hey, you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm just going to simply ignore this. That's the first thing we do. We also determine to, to be good. Like we make a decision, to, okay, in my own power, in my own strength, I am now going to choose to clean up my act and be a good person. We do this like maybe in January every year and we decide that we're gonna get our act together. We're gonna turn over a new leaf. And so whether that's sobriety uh, or whatever it may be in your life that you're just like, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna step out and be a better person. And we soon after a week goes by, two days go by, uh, and then we realize, man, this is really tough and we can't do it with our own willpower. And the third thing, and probably the most destructive of all of these, they're all very destructive, but this is very destructive, is we know that since we can't be perfect, we just choose to indulge in our sin, which is just like, hey, I'm just gonna do whatever I wanna do. Uh, and that's whenever people would just tell you, hey, you be you. And I wanna let you know, uh, I wanna do a sermon series called You Be You Sometimes. I think that's the worst advice anyone could ever give you. You should never just be you because here's the thing, whenever you choose to just be you, uh, you are going to destruct your life. And so uh, imagine this for a moment. Imagine that we went to a store together and there were rules when you walked in this store. The rule is, is this, is that everything that you touch, you have to buy. And this is the way we do sin in our lives sometimes. Everything that you touch, you have to buy. And so initially, as you're walking through the store, you're very aware that you're not supposed to touch anything. But as time goes on, you begin to start touching things and you touch different products and, and over and over and over again and things begin to become a little more alluring to you. And so you start touching multiple things uh, and you go, man, what's, the, what's gonna be the consequence for this? What's gonna be the consequence for that? And you just start indulging, 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 indulging. And here's the problem. You go to check out of the store and you realize, oh my gosh, I have racked up an insurmountable debt. And that's the difficulty with just simply indulging in sin is you touch or you feel everything that you want. And in the process, you build up so many consequences that you can't get out of it. So really, somebody said, said it like this, and I love it. Sin is fun on credit. You have fun now and you pay later. And man, there couldn't be a truer statement out there, man. Do not hide your sins from God. Make a decision that you're just going to tell God, man, I'm going to be a real person and let you know where I'm at and seek forgiveness from God and seek right living. And so don't try to hide your sin from God. Truth number four is God knows all about me and he still loves me. God knows all about me and yet he still loves me. Look at verse 16 here in the story. You're right, Jesus says, you don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. This woman said, so she changed it. She changes the conversation. Uh, and instead of talking about uh, reality, she chooses to talk about religion. And we love doing that even today, if we're honest. Like, so we get confronted with our sin. And instead of talking about the reality of where we're actually at, we like to talk about religion instead. We like to change and divert the subject. And that's exactly what she does. She says, I know that you're a Mess the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. And what's gripping about this story is the woman left her water jar beside the well, ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. Man, I want to tell you something. Believe that the one who knows you best loves you most. Man, I think this truth today, if there's one thing I want to tell you, it's this. Listen to me. Lean forward a little bit. I want you to hear this. Believe that the one who knows you best 
loves you the most. Man, it's true. He is absolutely crazy about you. Um, there's a, a show called The Chosen, and this has been one of the most powerful things that has came out in the last year that I've watched. And uh, I've watched a lot of TV because of COVID over the last year, I'm telling you, man. Um, this show depicts the love of Jesus better than any show I've ever seen. You can download The Chosen app on your phone. It's just an app. You can open up your app store. It's called The Chosen. Uh, I want you to watch a scene from the end of episode eight. It's known as The Woman of the Well, and it illustrates this story so absolutely powerfully. So check out this scene from season eight of the first season, or episode eight of the first season of The Chosen. Check this out. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well. None of them will be seen with me, so I have to come out new, in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water, if, if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Wrong story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here that it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done.
you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sort this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married, but he wasn't a good man. He hurt you, and it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon. Just the heart. <laughs> you promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Your water! You forgot your um. Fancy, you man! You told me everything I ever did! <laughs> See, God knows all about you and still loves the real you. Isn't that powerful? And uh, come see, come meet a man who told me everything about myself, and he still loved me. And so the next steps for each of us. Uh, the woman at the well had a next step, and I really believe you have a next step. And so you watch a powerful clip like that and you just think, okay, man, could God love and accept me? And the answer is yes. But the first thing you have to do is you got to get real with God. And instead of pretending, instead of hiding, just get real with him. And this is where she got. She got to the spot where she was done talking about religion and wanted to talk about reality. And reality is she felt rejected. Reality was she felt used. Reality was she was a victim, right? But here's the thing. You and I have to talk real when it comes to talking to God. And so, man, I wonder today, could you have a real moment uh, right now where you just pause this video and talk to God? Like, could you have a real moment where you just meet with him? Uh, no matter where you're at today, no matter how many steps you've taken away from him, you can talk to God right now about the reality of where you're at. The first thing is you got to get real with God. The second thing is you got to get approval from God and God alone. Like, man, stop trying to get approval from all these fake Facebook friends that you have, from all these Instagram followers that you have. Stop pursuing approval in all of the wrong places with all of the wrong people. And instead say, man, that I'm playing for an audience of one, right? And so uh, Jesus is sitting right next to you right now, giving you a full-length mirror version of yourself. And I wonder what it is that you're seeing. And my hope is that you're seeing that you are a daughter or a son of the king. And it doesn't matter what other people think about you, man, that you've got to get approval from God and God alone. The third thing is to show up at the well. Man, this woman shows up at the well 
and she gets something that she never would have imagined that afternoon. And I wonder if that's where you're at today, that even in watching this, you've gotten something out of this that you would have never imagined. And my hope is, is that you just keep showing up at the well, that you keep showing up because here's the thing, Jesus wants to do something in your heart that nothing else can do. Not a new car, not a new house, not a new relationship. The only thing that's ever going to satisfy your heart, the only thing that can ever fill in that blank is a relationship with God through Jesus. And if you don't have that kind of relationship, I want to challenge you, man. Let's start pursuing this person of Jesus. Don't make it about anything else other than meeting, knowing, and following him. So show up at the well. And then here's the fourth and last thing. Accept the fact that God loves you. Don't let this be about religion anymore. Don't let this be about something fake any longer. Let this be about reality. Accept the fact that God loves the real you. Man, stop faking, stop pretending, stop hiding, and just make a decision to say, man, you know what? I know that God loves me enough to find me and to save me. In fact, I want to leave you with this thought. God loves the real you. He also loves you enough not to keep you the way that he found you. This woman had a drastic life change, right? I got to believe that she didn't just continue the same lifestyle that she had, that she didn't just continue with the, the same destructive habits that she had, that there was something that changed in her life as a result of meeting Jesus. And I wonder today, has something happened in your life since you've met Jesus? Has something changed in your life? And if it hasn't, Maybe today is the day to go, man, God, I know that you love the real me, but you also love me enough not to leave me the, the same way that you found me. I want to tell you, man, I'm going to pray for you right now. And so when you bow your heads and close your eyes, let's just have a real moment, uh, a real moment with God. So your head's bowed, your eyes closed. Will you just talk to God right now, just in a still moment, just say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for healing me. And God, thank you for loving me enough not to keep me the same way that you found me. God, I thank you for the story of the woman at the well. And I thank you that no matter how far we've gotten away from you, no matter how many steps we've taken away, you have taken the direct route to Samaria right to our hearts to meet us right where we're at. So God, I don't know what the hurts are today, I don't know what the hangups are today. I don't know what the habits are today that need to be destroyed. But God, I pray that we would go and let everyone know about a man who told us everything about ourselves. God, help us to see that you love the real version of us and that you want nothing more than a relationship with us. God, we love you, and we cannot wait to see what you're going to do next in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray all of this. Amen. Hey, I want you to know God loves the real you. Take a next step as you meet, know, and follow Jesus. Thanks for watching. Hope you have an awesome day. Thank you again for worshiping with us. You know, here at Grace River, we worship in three ways. We worship in song, we worship in the reading of God's word, and we worship by giving in our offering. Something that we believe is that we give first, save second, and then live on the rest. And it's only reasonable that we would give back to a God that gave us everything. If you feel led to give, you can visit the website below and give online. Thank you so much for worshiping with us, and I hope you have a great week.